Hello everybody, Nelson Virgil here with Program for Wellness Restoration. We're a nonprofit organization that focuses on educational uh, content for patients and clinicians about HIV, side effect management, and cure research. Uh, today we have the honor to have uh, two of the top uh, research activists in the world. I would consider that that's my own, obviously I have biases, but you guys really are the one of the two smartest guys I know in the field when it comes to research advocacy. Uh, giving us an update on what's been happening since our last video. We did a video last year that is being watched over 3,000 times. So today we're updating everybody on basically 12 months of work since then. So I will start with introducing, um, you're gonna have each one of you introduce yourself, uh, uh, Robert uh, Reinhardt and Richard Jeffries. Robert, why don't we start with you and tell everybody um, what, do you, what you do and, and where you work. Okay, well, thank you for that kind and, uh, at least in my case, undeserved introduction. But uh, I uh, operate both in Canada and the United States. In Canada, as a community liaison for a national consortium called CanCure, which looks at uh, research strategies uh, for HIV cure for a, a certain cell population. And I work with other groups and other investigators internationally. As you say, my, my main focus is advocacy for HIV cure research, supporting that with, with funding and other kinds of um, knowledge dissemination activities. Thank you. Richard? Um, yes, thanks for the generous introduction, um, Nelson. Um, I'm, I'm Richard Jeffries from Treatment Action Group, which is a community-based advocacy organization based in New York City uh, that grew out of Act Up New York. And I'm the director of the um, Basic Science Vaccines and Cure Project. So try and follow what's happening in cure research and cover that for TAG. Thank you. So why don't we start with um, a real brief update. Uh, well, before we start, I'd like to actually say a few words on something that um, most people may or may not know. But um, this year, uh, I think it was uh, you and Croy, two or three months ago, um, Timothy Brown, the only person cured of HIV in the world, um, celebrated his 10-year anniversary of his cure. And to be honest with you, um, I'm, a, I'm a research activist too, not as involved as you guys when it comes to cure anymore. But I was, um, I was hoping <laughs> when we heard about the news 10 years ago that something would happen and he would not be the only one cured in a decade. So it's been um, very surprising and a little bit disappointing, not only for me, but for the entire world to see the fact that we have not been able to replicate his case. In fact, um, the doctors that cured him um, by a very innovative um, approach tried to do the same thing with um, at least five other patients. And unfortunately, they all died uh, due to complications. Um, so that was very unfortunate. And obviously, it's not a practical thing to do since um, they're high risk. But today's um, um, object, uh, objective is to find out what else are, are clinicians and researchers uh, looking at to try to accelerate the, the cure for HIV. So we're gonna go into an update of the latest uh, conference that happened in February, uh, the CROI conference. So um, Richard, you wrote a beautiful, long, um, beautiful article for your treatment advocacy uh, group um, newsletter. Is a uh, in the tag.org uh, website. So why don't we start with, with you giving us a highlights of, of that conference. Um, sure thing. So there was a few bits of news. I think, um, you know, one of the challenges with, with, with trying to reproduce Timothy's case, obviously, is, is that he was basically given an entire new immune system that was resistant to, to HIV. And that, that took, and, and um, that seems to have, have been able to protect him. Um, and I think it's been very challenging to do that with other people. But there have been some case, similar cases where a, a stem cell transplant can greatly reduce the amount of HIV that's still residing in the body. Um, and there was another case like that reported at Croy this year uh, where an individual uh, received a stem cell transplant. 
it wasn't from a donor that was resistant to HIV infection. It was just from a normal donor. And it was part of, like Timothy, it was part of treatment for cancer. Um, and it greatly reduced the, the, the amount of the HIV they could detect in his body. And eventually they did an antiretroviral uh, therapy interruption. And he actually went for uh, 288 days without any rebound. So that's a, a very kind of strict remission where there doesn't seem to have been any HIV activity at all for, for that period, a little over nine months. And so it does kind of support the idea that actually, if you can do something, you know, hopefully one day less extreme than a stem cell transplant to reduce the, the HIV reservoir in the body, it can lead to this sort of prolonged remission from the infection. Unfortunately, it didn't last. Um, they're still looking at what might have happened, why the, if there was precipitating factors that maybe caused the viral rebound, you know, there were, he was actually involved in a car accident shortly before it happened. So there's some speculation, maybe the stress caused inflammation and that somehow there was a wandering, you know, one or two cells still containing HIV that got an inflammatory kind of signal and, and that caused the rebound. But again, I think it's kind of, um, there have been these cases, and I think Robert knows of a couple of other cases where actually this, you know, quite extreme stem cell transplant intervention, but it has shown that you can uh, greatly reduce the reservoir. I don't know if you want to mention some of those other cases, Robert. Thank you. Well, you know, as Richard is explaining, it, it, it's very difficult to exactly duplicate what happened to Timothy because that really wasn't a sort of pre-planned clinical trial, it was sort of a, a pre-planned discovery, I guess you might call it, that people sort of anticipated. But in trying to reproduce these cases, there have been some suggestions. One case out of a European consortium called ISYSTEM and some other glimmers of ideas of cases out of Australia with patients who have been given these kinds of transplants and uh, chemotherapy conditioning, they haven't been taken off of antiretroviral drugs so that we know whether they're going to have rebound or not. But the kind of signals that they produce are what you might call Timothy Brown-like or, or hopeful in that direction. With the Mayo Clinic patient, I think my concern, sometimes I'm a glass half empty kind of guy. It's true he waited 288 days till rebound but it also shows how small a virus reservoir, maybe even a single particle, you know, is sufficient to cause rebound and how much we really need to hunt down the virus. Any, any um, other update from the conference? Are you, as part of your, your article, uh, Richard? Sure. The, probably the study that drew the most attention uh, was um, presented by Beatrice Mothe from a Spanish research institute, which I'm not sure I can pronounce correctly, IACAXA, I think. Um, and it was uh, a, a definitely a, a somewhat more practical approach than, than we, we've been talking about with stem cell transplants. It was a combination of therapeutic vaccines. Um, so the idea being to try and boost the immune response to the virus or create a better immune response, more effective immune response, combined with an agent, a romidepsin, an HDAC inhibitor, which in some studies um, seems to be able to sort of wake up some of the HIV reservoir that's kind of invisible because it's not active. And so the hope was that maybe combining a, a sort of immune booster with the latency sort of reverser would, would have some effect. Um, and what they found was that uh, these were, uh, they had 13 individuals that had been in a prior study of the therapeutic vaccines and were enrolled in a follow-up study where they got the romidepsin and some additional shots with the therapeutic vaccines. They then interrupted their antiretroviral therapy. And um, so far, five out of the 13 have not met the criteria for restarting antiretroviral therapy, which was um, a viral load over 2,000 copies. And so that's a sort of, it's hard to draw major conclusions from such small numbers, but um, probably the highest proportion of people that have been shown to control viral load to that kind of low level after early treatment has been around, you know, 0% to maybe 15% at most. And five out of 13 is like close to 40%. So it does appear that the interventions 
enhance the ability of those individuals to control their viral load uh, without antiretroviral therapy. Um, it's, you know, the longest person is a little over six months, I think. So it's not certain how long it might last. Um, additional follow-up is required. Uh, whether the romidepsin actually contributed, we don't know because it was just a single arm study, which means that everybody got the same interventions. There wasn't a control group that received something mm -hmm. different. Um, the, the, the researcher believes that the vaccine helps target the immune response on, on regions of the virus that are very conserved and are perhaps most, most vulnerable to attack um, by, by the immune system and that that may be uh, causing the viral load control, but that's being looked at now. And so the, it's a sort of hint that maybe, you know, that, that it is possible to, to um, increase the number of people that, that are capable of controlling viral load, but whether you can do it in a way that's lasting is, is unclear. And this is a, and you know, this is a chemotherapy agent combined with a vaccine. I actually not at the same time, right? So, explain to the audience. And some people obviously, you know, don't know much about research when it comes to cure. Why would we give a chemo agent to an HIV positive person uh, to try to find out if if their HIV reservoir goes down or they can control the virus without medication? Okay, so an HDAC inhibitor like romidepsin, it's, it's not chemotherapy as, as you might generally think about it. We, you know, we, I think oftentimes when people say chemotherapy, they're talking about something that's designed to kill cells, right? Cytotoxic chemotherapy, mm -hmm. which is may, you know, kills cancer cells, kills healthy cells, is pretty horrible to take. Uh, 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 the HDAC inhibitor is mm -hmm. an anti cancer agent, but it works by modulating how the genes in the cells, the, the sort of controlling uh, uh, functions of the cells, uh, our, our, our work and it tries to modulate that and it's able to maybe modulate because it's into the genes where HIV is integrated and by modulating those genes it's able to kind of prompt HIV uh, to come out of, of, of that hiding spot and so that's that's the idea of, of giving it to HIV positive people is, is that you've got some cells very small number mostly where, where HIV is locked inside the genome into the genes of the cell and the HDAC inhibitor may be able to um, uh, uh, prompted out, sort of goaded out of, of, of that hiding place. Um, whether that can really work is, I think, still controversial. Um, I, and I, I know Robert's kind of skeptical, and I, th I think that's kind of an important perspective to hear. Why are you skeptical, Robert, of uh, HDAX and that approach? Yeah, well, I think you bring up a good point, um, Nelson, and, and also Richard's response that in cure research today, I think we're in sort of this sort of early, what I almost think of as a Wild West stage of thinking about possible combinations of things. Um, almost everything looks good, somewhat theoretically and maybe somewhat uh, biologically, but the amount of pre-planned data or availability of data of why we pick certain things to combine with each other I think can be very tenuous. Not only this trial for the, the reasons that, that Richard mentioned, you know, we don't know which was responsible for the result, uh, but there are some other trials in combination where um, it, it would be nice if we had not only a sort of the, totally theoretical model, but some real combination information data about why two things work more synergistically. With these, latency reactivation agents, um, it sounds good. Oh, we're going to make the virus creep out and something's going to recognize it. But the degree of th HIV creeping out and being recognized is very, very tenuous sometimes. So it'd be nice, I think, if there was some more rationale for some of the combinations. But Robert, do we have to know everything to find a cure? I mean, some cures are, are found without even knowing how they work. You know, no, you're quite right. And again, Timothy Brown is a great example where somebody sort of took a chance and as a case proof of principle. I think we need both. We need these proof of principle ideas, but then once we have an idea, how do we improve on it to do something a little bit larger? And you said there are uh, other combinations or, or the combination approaches that are being tried. Uh, can either one of you add some more to, um, to what they are? Um, so the other kinds of combinations that are being looked at 
Um, in addition to therapeutic vaccines, uh, there, there's also broadly uh, these things called broadly neutralizing antibodies. Um, these are antibodies that have been fished out of uh, HIV positive people. They don't, there's not enough of them to actually contribute to control usually in, 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 in the person they're from. But when they're fished out and, and, and sort of manufactured, some of them are highly potent. They can strongly inhibit HIV from all kinds of different clades. And so they're given this uh, nomenclature of broadly neutralizing. Um, a bunch of them now have been manufactured, so they're ready to test in people. There's ongoing clinical trials, again, looking at broadly neutralizing antibodies in combination with each other, in combination with HDAC inhibitors like romadepsin, to, uh, because there's evidence that they, in addition to blocking HIV directly, the antibodies may be able to um, promote the uh, killing of infected cells by the immune system. Uh, these, the, this uh, thing called antibody dependent cellular cytotoxicity, which basically just means the sort of antibody recruits uh, killer cells to the infected cell and helps wipe it out. And so th those kinds of things are being looked at. Um, and there was a study, one of the studies presented at Croy had two different broadly neutralizing antibodies given to, um, it was an animal experiment in, in macaques infected with a shiv. After infection, they gave a short course of the dual antibodies and these animals, most of them controlled virus after the antibody therapy was stopped. So that's very unusual. That was published shortly after the conference. And so there is some hope that, that maybe those kinds of uh, approaches, combinations, can, can also be effective. Robert? And I think, I don't think this was reported so much at Croy, although it's been in development, but uh, Dan Marouche is about to start, uh, or maybe he's even started, Richard, uh, a combination trial of a therapeutic vaccine and antibody as a sort of larger, potentially, you know, curative trial, um, which, you know, could be probably very interesting. And he's an example of what I was referring to before as somebody who I think has sort of tried to accumulate a biological rationale and, and data to suggest why this might be a hopeful kind of experiment. And uh, for the audience that has no knowledge at all of um, obviously of HIV uh, research, just very briefly, no more than a few minutes, tell us why we have not been able to find just a vaccine that doesn't need a combination of other agents to work when it comes to HIV. Why is HIV such a tricky virus that we cannot just find a, a vaccine like we did for polio, for instance? Well, you're also hitting on something near to my heart, which is what are the kinds of lessons that we can learn from the effort to find a preventive vaccine, which is hard enough, and apply that, if possible, to a therapeutic vaccine. You know, Richard sort of alluded to this just now about how one of the ways in which vaccines work effectively, like the polio vaccine, is can you teach the body to generate antibodies that really prevent infection or which can attack an infection that's already established and perhaps people do show examples after two or three years of infection of generating antibodies, but by then this virus has mutated away from the kind of preventive blocking that those antibodies are able to perform. Also, this virus is covered with a big sugary shield, which means that the targets of the antibodies to go in and block are sort of punted away. I will say again, when we think about, you know, are there isolated cases? This year, there was a very interesting paper published. Again, just one person has been shown to act this way. Person who um, does not seem to need antiretroviral therapy and who on their own was able to show generation of combination antibodies that, again, the investigators suspect, we don't know, may have been the reason that they seem to be able to control their virus. And if that person is an example, it would be very interesting to try to replicate with an experiment. So you can harvest the antibodies from them, like Richard said, actually mass produce them in a combination and hopefully 
So those lucky people who are basically what less than one percent of HIV population that can able that are able to control the virus for longer terms, uh, they, they, they're not cure. Obviously, they have some viral replication, but uh, very low levels. Those people can serve as um, you know as uh, sources for antibodies that could be re reproduced uh, in. in and so there, that's where most of the antibody work comes from, from actually identifying these individuals and, and, and trying to isolate what actually is. Yeah. is well, I think the example Richard was saying, well, how we found these antibodies is not so much from elite controllers, but, but other kinds of people, but elite controllers may provide another model as well. We, we, you're right, we need to figure out why each is able to either teach us how to produce these things or teach us why they are controlling the virus. When it comes to, wanna, I'm sorry, uh, go elaborate. ahead. I, hold on, I broke, you, I broke off and sometimes, uh, you know, so finish your sentence, I'm sorry, I, I was rude. Oh, to I, I was just gonna defer to Richard that uh, I think his explanation at the beginning was correct, um, that uh, it's very rare to see um, this kind of protection from people being generated and often, again, if their infection is chronic, they don't personally benefit. And I think also to sort of to answer your, uh, uh, your question partly, Nelson, one of the big challenges with HIV compared to other pathogens, um, and, and this is relevant to both vaccine and cure research, is that its, its preferred target cell is, is the cell that coordinates the immune response, right? It's the CD4 cell. If you get infected with, with flu or CMV or, or another virus, it's gonna be the CD4 cell that's recruiting all the other components of the immune system to do their job, control or eliminate the virus. When the CD4 cell tries to do that against HIV, it's vulnerable to being infected, um, but being rendered dysfunctional by the infection. And so the sort of, you know, the general or the quarterback or whatever metaphor you might want to use for the CD4's role in the immune response, you know, it's being compromised. So the virus is messing with the very, the very cell that, that needs to lead the charge against it. And, and that's a difficult challenge to address. You know, that's one of the reasons people are looking like, at things like gene therapy, because in, it's possible that really to, for, to, to really cure a lot of people, you know, you might need to do something to protect their CD4 cells from the virus. And that may be very difficult to do other than with gene therapy. So let's talk about that. That's a good segue into the next topic, which is modifying CD4 cells um, to be able to fight off HIV. So tell us, uh, so a lot that's been going on. Some biotech uh, companies have spent some effort and funding on this. Um, tell us uh, where we are. Um, sure. So, so Carl June gave a researcher called Carl June from the University of Pennsylvania, who's been doing a lot of gene therapy work in cancer, gave a plenary at Croy about um, that kinds of work, uh, which involves not just modifying CD4 cells to try and make them resistant to HIV, but also giving other immune cells, particularly CD8 T cells, kind of uh, uh, equipping them with a receptor that sort of allows them to see better uh, their targets. Um, so in cancer, it allows them to target cancer cells better. And maybe in HIV, we can get the CD8 cells to target HIV better by modifying them with gene therapy. And, and, and that's something that he sort of highlighted that there aren't any trials mm -hmm. happening right now. But I think that there are people working on that and we can anticipate trials in the near future. Um, there was also a community workshop on cure research at Croy and, and Hans-Peter Kiem from the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Center and the Defeat HIV Collaboratory talked about their work. Um, they're, so they're only sort of getting into people with HIV and cancers at the moment, not people without cancers, but they are doing some stem cell modification, introducing genes to try and make CD4 cells resistant. And they're sort of one of the interesting things about their approach is that they've seen some positive results in macaque studies. So they wanna look at um, whether you can modif uh, combine the gene therapy with a vaccine, so you try and sort of expand uh, the number of CD4 cells that are resistant, but also targeting HIV. So you've got this kind of army against HIV that the virus can't infect, and that's one of their goals for the, for the future, and I think that might be quite a promising approach. Robert, do you have anything to add to the gene therapy uh, discussion? 
Um, yeah, I, I think that Richard's point is very well taken about how we um, can start with that example of Timothy Brown. And then when you look at people at the Defeat Collaboratory and elsewhere, how they're using these gene editing techniques to think of other ways to sort of alter the availability of, of cells that can do their function or, or orchestrate the response, as Richard said. And some of the other advances that I find interesting are that um, there have been some other papers of a more general nature, perhaps also not at Croy, about um, sort of the machinery and the, the almost factory-like way of making uh, these cells happen. And so hopefully those are going to make the job of, of introducing these modified cells a little bit easier than always relying on um, hard to find transplant donors. Um, so it, it is very encouraging to see some of these advances in that field. And uh, let's talk a little bit about funding. I know you guys are probably not involved with funding uh, discussions, but uh, where are people usually getting the funds, uh, researchers getting the funds, at least in the United States, to do this kind of uh, studies? Um, do these studies also benefit any other conditions outside HIV? And, um, and uh, any concerns about future funding due to the current uh, administration that we are going through right now, real quick? Um, okay, well, I'll, I guess I'll go first on this controversial question. I, I, you know, obviously we live in strange times and um, I think, unfortunately, we currently have an administration in the United States that doesn't value science very much. You know, they're proposing an absurd 20% cut to the budget of the National Institutes of Health. Um, this would be terrible. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's kind of taking away a possible future and you don't even know what you're losing because, because the cuts would be so huge and broad. Um, that the kinds of advances we could make in medicine won't happen and we won't know what we haven't, you know, what we've lost. Um, it would be terrible. I think Congress will stop that happening, but it's still, it's still kind of sad to see science being so devalued. Um, and obviously there was a lot of marches this past weekend uh, by, by many hundreds of thousands, millions of people that are upset about that. Um, I think in terms of what's happening now in cure research, you know, the National Institutes of Health probably funds about two thirds, uh, maybe three quarters globally of what's happening. Um, and there is a lot of potential, I think, for cross pollination with other fields. Um, the International AIDS Society is having a conference in July on HIV cure research and cancer research. Um, some of the immunotherapies that have started quite working quite dramatically in cancer have their origins partly in, in HIV research around T cell function. Um, and I think also HIV vectors are being used to treat cancer patients to deliver genes that are therapeutic and those have been working very well. So there's huge potential, you know, I and at the bottom line about HIV is, 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 is for all the horrors that it's caused. It's also forced us to learn more about the human immune system than we, than we, than we ever knew before. And, and though, you know, the more you learn about how you can, the immune system is incredibly powerful. If you can turn it on as a weapon and, and use it, that, that, that's going to be a huge thing for the future. That's right. Robert, from Canada, but you work in the United States. Uh, uh, it's hard to add to really the, all the great points that Richard made. Maybe one point I would elaborate on, again, this idea of how <laughs> HIV research is so synergistic with other important disease problems. Um, I think everybody needs to do a better job of explaining the story of the way in which research, both basic and clinical research, um, helps you know, all diseases uh, understanding these important immune functions that Richard referred to. One of the areas globally that I think really deserves a lot more attention and which often gets short shrift, especially on this cure angle, not just drug therapy, are the intersections of HIV with other serious co-infections like tuberculosis, malaria, hepatitis, the, the, the interaction, the epidemiology of how this affects people globally causing millions of really 
uh, unnecessary deaths is, is a, an area of scientific research that is tremendously uh, underexplored. Uh, there is going to be a, a great uh, conference next year in Keystone where TB, HIV immunology, co-infection is going to be looked at. And again, I think for, the, for curative purposes, understanding the immunological overlap between these very serious diseases can help us think about how to help people in a lot of different situations. Good points, good points. So what do you guys think when, when somebody is telling, uh, I get from the community a lot of uh, emails, and one of the very common ones is that uh, pharmaceutical industry uh, is not looking forward to having a cure. They're not spending any efforts on a cure. Does they want to be spending, uh, everybody's spending millions on their, on their drugs. What, what, what do you say to that? So that's a very common question that I get. I mean, I think you have to look at the example of hepatitis C, right? Uh, you know, uh, hepatitis C can be cured. There's been a massive pharmaceutical company investment in curing hepatitis C. You know, the focus hasn't been on, on trying to make mm -hmm. chronic treatments the way people often say. Um, and, and unfortunately, the, you know, what, what the, the downside is, is it, it, the problem isn't that the pharmaceutical industry doesn't want to develop cures. The problem is that when they work, they're going to charge a fortune for them, right? Yes. So that, that, that's the big advocacy issue. That, that's what people are wrestling with in hepatitis C right now. And let's, um, let's now move into a subject that is dear to my heart and dear to your hearts too, because we're all working together right now trying to get some uh, interest uh, from not only industry and researchers, uh, funding sources about a minority of the HIV population um, called uh, immunological non-responders. Um, you know, we're getting the news, um, a lot of good, good news about HIV, that we have several treatments and people are doing better, and obviously that's true. But there are at least 17 to 20 percent of us that have been positive sometimes for a long time, that uh, even though we're taking our medications on time, our viral load is undetectable, we have not been able to reconstitute our immune system to a level where hopefully uh, we do not have as many uh, complications in the future. And um, there's really, that's almost like an orphan um, population. Nobody's really spending much time on trying to find ways to boost their immune system and hopefully their, their future uh, survival. So um, we are all the three of us working in a, in a Kind of my working group trying to, um, we already had a meeting with the FDA, which was very positive. The FDA is very supportive of more research in this area. But tell us more about why uh, it is important to do research to help these people, what benefits we're going to get beyond just saving them or helping them, and um, what can industry and researchers do to to accelerate and, and be, be um, motivated to spend money on, on some uh, therapeutic approaches that may actually be approved for, for this population. So either one of you, Robert or Richard, whoever. Um, I, I guess I could start. It's true, we've all three of us been thinking about this problem. Um, but when you start out by saying a minority of, of us, so the us globally right now is about 37 million people yes. who we are estimating have HIV. So, you know, uh, that could be 8 million people. It's a lot, a lot of people. And we need to understand, I think, a lot more about the reasons of why people have a hard time recovering, you know, this sort of immune function, uh, whether they are on ART or sometimes not. And um, uh, to me, again, this is another sort of secondary outcome that we might hope for out of cure research, even if we are going to be short of actually having cures that are safe, effective, accessible, and, and available to all. You know, what are some of the interim steps before we get to full-blown cure? So if cure research sort of by definition is thinking about reviving boosting, again, these are metaphors of, you know, making the immune function 
um, more able to do its job, uh, a lot of the strategies that are being used suggest that we really need to think about designing studies and trials that, that include this population within a, an ethically designed and, and, and trial that, that will provide some maybe proof of concept or information. And there are other ideas out there um, about therapeutic agents that might help boost CD4 counts, or if we think that this phenomenon is, is generated by some kind of um, exhaustion of the immune system or deterioration, are there agents that are, are good at sort of helping to counteract that? You know, Richard and I, and I think you too, um, we are all geeky enough. We also like to read all the posters at these conferences, which always don't get attention. And there was a poster at Croy about uh, the drug metformin, which might be used to help with this immune exhaustion problem, if indeed it is a factor in thinking about this. Um, I just also want to give a shout out for poster viewing, because remember, the whole enterprise of Cure Research started because Marty Delaney looked at a poster that talked about Timothy Brown and pushed it in front of people. So there's some value in trying to find out this information. Mm -hmm. Richard? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I'd echo that, obviously. I, th I think, you know, one of the challenges we face is, is um, and that we've been discussing a little bit, is, is, is proving the benefit of an intervention in the immunologic non-responder population and, and, you know, thankfully, the, the incidence of, of illness or, 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 or premature mortality is low, which is a good thing. But if you want to show that a, an intervention, if it's an immune booster of some kind, actually has a benefit to people, you have to do a very large trial. And so, you know, may, may, one of the things we'd like to do is encourage researchers to look at whether there are sort of less serious endpoints that could actually be evaluated that might help um, in the design of trials that are a bit more feasible to conduct, maybe involving hundreds of people rather than thousands. Um, and I think, uh, like Robert said, also just to be cognizant of the potential for a cure intervention, if it doesn't actually have a curative effect, that it may affect a mechanism that could be beneficial for immunologic non-responders. And, and that's something that, 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 that we want to sort of keep, keep an eye out for. There was one study presented by Priscilla Hugh from UCSF at, at, at Croy of an anti-inflammatory antibody that had quite dramatic effect on, on various uh, inflammation markers, um, sort of more than have been seen before. I can't really pronounce it. I think it's canakinumab or something like that. Uh, it inhibits IL-1 beta, which is, which is some kind of inflammatory cytokine. And so that's in a large study in HIV negative people for heart disease and, and there'll probably be additional studies. I think they're doing a larger study now at UCSF. Um, and so that may be something that, that, that would have some potential. And there's also an antibody that, that the NIH, Tony Fauci is looking at in Cure Research that I also can't pronounce, um, VEDU something MAB. Um, and, and that may be... It's, it's a biologics, like, you know, all the, they all end up in MAB. If you can pronounce it, Robert, go ahead. You, 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 well, I'll just take a shot. Yes, we had a losing hand. Okay, there you go. Um, and so, uh, in the in the monkey study they did before the human trial, it seemed to promote immune, you know, quite uh, significant CD4 reconstitution. So maybe there's some promise there too. Yeah, and you know, I'm actually interested in therapies that are already approved for other conditions. Yeah, and that's an example. Like yeah, faster. And there's some research on JAK inhibitors that are, you know, approved for um, uh, rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, some of them are approved for um, inflammatory bowel disease. Some of them are approved for uh, melanoma. So a lot of these biologics, and it is the hot, it's a hot time for biologics, uh, approval of biologics in, in all kinds of conditions. And that really interests me because they're already approved. Um, they could be, uh, you know, they could generate another indication for a small population. And, uh, Robert, I get what you say. It, we're not really a small, a guy in our, the, are not as small as 20%, but 20% of 36 million is not a small number. But 
you know, relatively. Uh, very interested also in the metformin data. It is approved as an old generic for diabetes. I actually started taking it that day when I read that poster that Robert sent, and uh, we'll see. I know I'm, I'm an end of one, and I like to self-test. Um, very interesting, uh, interesting data on inflammation and, and even oral liposomal glutathione, which is an antioxidant that our bodies uh, produce to combat disease and inflammation. And there's some very interesting data I've talked to the researchers. So my obsession lately is because you guys do a really good job on what you do, I do my job on what I can do, which is concentrate on things that are already out there, either prescription-based or over-the-counter, believe it or not, um, that could lead to some sort of even improve of 20% of immune response or even decreasing inflammation while we're taking HIV medications, while we have an viral load of under 20 copies, which is undetectable. And, you know, as we age with HIV and aging with HIV is a hot topic because more than 50% of us in the United States mm -hmm. are reaching 50 years of age or older. And obviously as we get older, there are other complications that we may actually have at a younger um, age than, than HIV negative. So um, what I plead to anybody watching uh, this video, especially from industry, is not to assume that proving that a therapy that increases CD4s for that population uh, is going to be very impossible or hard to prove um, to the FDA, or you're going to have to spend millions and millions of dollars in long-term uh, data gathering. Um, we've had some experience in the past with interleukin-2 and even interleukin-17, and, and uh, obviously that led to no approval. And I think a lot of companies kind of shied away from looking at an immune-boosting um, therapy. So my plea to industry and even funders, who knows who watches this, is that there is a need out there. Uh, more, we will have more than HIV benefiting from this research. Uh, there is a possibility for a fast-track approval with a smaller number of patients if we find markers that um, have clinical relevance beyond survival, obviously, uh, that's a long study. So you will hear more about this for the audience out there. Um, for those of you that have, you know, obviously uh, over under 350 CD4 cells after at least three years of taking your meds on time and having on detector viral load, um, this is this message is for you. you know, I'm not, we're not trying to scare people. We do have a higher risk of, of complications in the future. And, um, and uh, as patients, we have to advocate for this too. So industry, don't give up on that. Uh, just here uh, and actually tag at uh, tag.org. Uh, you guys have a, a press release that we send out uh, with uh, minutes from the FDA meeting. There's interest in this. Um, there's ways to get something approved. Obviously, there's, there's going to be discussions on what markers to use. And, um, and more, than, more than one pathology can benefit from this. So I'm going to get off my soapbox. So this is a very personal, obviously, uh, topic for, for me and, and for you guys. So, so, so let's talk uh, before we, we close out because we're almost at 40 minutes. I promised uh, to keep this under 45, just real quick. What do you tell patients and doctors too, actually, treating physicians, when they hear every other week or every three weeks or every month news about the, the latest cure or the latest, you know, on, on the media? Um, how do we manage that hype without losing hope, obviously? Either one of you. Well, that's a tough one because it, it doesn't, unfortunately, in, in an age when media outlets are increasingly sort of, un, sort of desperate for funding because of the old model of mm -hmm. newspapers doesn't really apply anymore, the new kind of currency is clicks, right? And so headlines that generate clicks are the kinds of headlines that media outlets want. And so, for example, the study we talked about earlier of the therapeutic vaccines where some people were controlling viral load a little bit those people were called HIV free by some newspaper headlines and news at, you know, independent in the UK. Um, and, and those things are problematic because uh, they're profoundly misleading to people. 
they could might cause people to join trials thinking they're going to be cured when in fact there could be a lot of risk in a trial. You know, the, the, the thing that I would recommend is that when you see misleading headlines, you know, write a letter to the editor. Uh, the, most um, media websites have a, a contact form. You know, it's a bit sort of, you know, after the fact. But if you keep doing it, then maybe eventually we can kind of shift perspective on that a little bit and try and get some more responsible reporting. Um, you know, I think in the meantime, right now we don't have a cure that's imminent and, and that's important for, for people to know. Robert, do you have anything to add to that very long talk? Yeah. Well, I sometimes think of this as, you know, we take both the short term view and the long term view. I mean, in a sense, this is never new because every serious disease, there, there's always this huge amount of built up hope among patients who have very serious outcomes to worry about. And so it's a natural human tendency to, to look for that. But I, I think um, as Richard's organization does tremendously well and others, um, it, it also is a, it also spurs you on to go out and meet with people and really talk through things and get to know people personally. I think not just through social media, but through real engagement activities. Um, I'll tell you one of the great things I've learned about interacting with populations in Canada, which has a very diverse HIV epidemiology, amazingly different populations of indigenous uh, people, African Caribbeans, uh, gay men, people who use drugs, um, the whole spectrum. And each brings so much rich ideas about what they think a cure means to them or what they want out of a cure. And when you actually get to sort of talk to people and, and learn about what they think about in their daily lives, it helps you, I think, get people back on track about what's good information for them and, and what's a good way to talk about it. So that's what I would add to what Richard is saying. Um, as resources, Richard, what, uh, where would you tell somebody that is interested in either joining a study uh, or looking at um, what studies are there? I know you write a report uh, called the Pipeline uh, Report. You guys do one a year, an update on the pipeline and research, not only for HIV, TB, and also for, uh, for cure. Can you tell us a little bit about where you would, you would send doctors and patients that want to find out more, not only about joining studies, but what the studies are actually, um, what they are? Um, sure. So uh, thankfully, these days, a lot of trials are registered in databases. And so one of the things TAG does is just have a web page that we update about once a month that sort of collates um, information on all the ongoing trials. Um, from the main databases, particularly clinicaltrials.gov, which is the US federal government a database where many trials are registered. Uh, the TAG pipeline report comes out once a year in July. So that will be out again this year. Um, I think the other thing that people might want to take a look at is, is in the US, um, the National Institutes of Health funds, the Martin and Delaney collaboratories named after the activists from Project Inform, um, there was three funded initially, they recently refunded, there's now six, I believe. Um, and uh, you can find on the uh, National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases website, there's a news release, if you search for it, for Martin Delaney listing those collaboratories. They're all instituting community advisory boards. I'm not sure if it's all complete yet. I think if you're a community person interested in, in, in being more involved, it might be worth reaching out to those collaboratory investigators to see if they have room um, um, for, to, for involvement in the community advisory bodies. Um, and that's also a good way of finding out what, what work is happening there. Yeah, and in my case, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, my nonprofit is called Program for Wellness Restoration and the website is powerusa.org. Uh, I have a contact form there that you can also fill out and I'll be more than happy to send you information on, you know, on cure studies that may or may not be enrolling yet. Um, there's information, <clears throat> excuse me, on my site uh, on general health, how to stay healthy with HIV. And obviously we have a YouTube channel uh, under Program for Wellness Restoration, 
where this video will be uploaded uh, for everybody to watch. You can also go to thebody.com. It's a site where um, uh, they have a bunch of experts and, and, and writers, and we post there too. Um, very good place to find out all kinds of information about staying healthy with HIV. Uh, Richard, how about um, from your side, any resources not only from Canada, but related to the work you do. Yeah, so you mean Robert. I'm, I'm sorry, aware. Robert. Yeah. <laughs> you gave me this <laughs> opportunity. Um, so I, I feel in hindsight, maybe we've been a little remiss in not including within this overall conversation some mention of the important work being done in HIV cure and treatment for pediatric populations. And there is a great... Uh, although it wasn't emphasized at CROI, there was a great plenary talk by Jen Tanat and Warrenich, which really captured a lot of what I thought was very important about um, not only how we look at cures across all different ages and populations, but this idea that I was trying to articulate and which she did a better job of doing of sort of the secondary benefits and understanding. So I would recommend people going to that. Um, our particular consortium in Canada has a great website. It's called cancurehiv.org. And um, we are trying as a community uh, engagement effort to start a new initiative where we create a sort of one-page friendly lay summaries to be handed to participants in studies about what happened in the research. And, this is not just for clinical trials, but I think a lot of people miss the opportunity to communicate results when people are just getting blood samples or there's no intervention. We're just trying to learn what's happening mechanistically and they often get overlooked. So we're trying to produce things that we're gonna start posting about the many sort of early basic science um, studies that happen where human participants interact with researchers and deservedly so should find out about what happened with the samples that they gave. Um, so, and the um, pediatric population group in the United States has a great website called the IMPACT, I-M-P-A-A-C-T, uh, set of trials, which are led by Deborah Prasad and others. And in Canada, the consortium is called the EPIC-4 consortium with a great website. Well, once again, thank you so much, you guys, for volunteering your time to update the community and, and clinicians. And I wanna thank all the audience um, that is watching this video. Please keep the hope up. Uh, people are working very hard to find a cure. Don't believe the, um, the hype, but also don't believe the negative um, messaging that may be coming to you about um, nobody really give, caring about finding a cure because there are many people competing. This is actually a, a huge competition out there to see who gets there first. And, and there are many teams. So there's hope. Uh, there's a lot of work to be done, a lot of advocacy to be done, a lot of funding issues that we still need to face in this new administration. And just stay tuned for the next update. And thanks a lot for, for my two friends and advocates, Richard, uh, uh, Jeffries and, and Robert uh, Reinhardt for donating their time and, and all the work they do for the community by going to all these conferences and, and being our geeks uh, to translate information to the community. So thank you so much and, and goodbye. And we'll see you soon in the next update. Bye bye. Bye guys. Bye. Thanks, Nelson. Awesome. There we go. Very good. Are you guys okay? But you guys always do great. It's very well. You know, we, we jumped around, but it's, I, it, 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 it flows fine. It, I, I, I'm happy. I think it was okay. Yeah, I forgot to mention the stuff about antiretroviral therapy completely blocking HIV replication, but maybe we can do that next time. Yeah, you know, otherwise, if you go over an hour, that nobody watches over 40 some minutes. Yeah, no, no. Those are the, most people watch only eight minutes, to be honest with you, but there's some that are highly empowered ones that stay on. <laughs> but you know, so we can always do another one at the end of the year. So it's, it's, it's no big deal. Well, you guys, thanks a lot. You did great. I'll send you um, a transcription maybe in a day or so. Just look at it real quick. Um, it'll be mostly my 
my ad is to myself more than you guys. Sometimes the, um, the transcribers don't hear uh, somebody, like you froze for a little while, Richard. So, but anyways, thanks a lot and I'll talk to you guys later, okay? Okay, sure thing, Nelson, thanks. Bye, Bye Robert.